Okay. So ethics in anthropology. All right, this is a big and, and kind of clinical and in the end for me depressing topic. Um, <clears throat> it's the 7th of October, Anthropology in the Human Condition. Today we're going to talk about ethics. Ethics and anthropology. So the critiques of colonial anthropology that we've been doing and the controversies of anthropologists' work is, is increasingly been leading up to this discussion. Um, the discussion of ethics is about what anthropologists should and should not do. And this topic, this question of ethics in anthropology, has an incredible amount to do with Vietnam. But most people in anthropology don't talk much about that. But you'd be surprised how important anthropology in Vietnam was, is, for the discussion of ethics. Now, anthropology and its issues and controversies um, are many and can be discussed in different ways, but one way to discuss all of them is around this topic of ethics and the guidelines that were developed since World War II, well, a statement anyway, but mostly since the war in this country and the American war and especially that American period and the 60s when American youth on the campuses were protesting against the war and very concerned about soldiers, young soldiers, young men mostly, going to die in the jungle. And the news was reporting this every night in American TV and students were concerned about this. Welcome. Um, I'm going to focus on two anthropology associations. The American Association of Anthropologists, the AAA, and the Association of Social Anthropologists from the UK, the ASA. Now the UK Association of Social Anthropologists and the USA AAA both produce documents or ethical guidelines. I mean, many, many groups produce ethical guidelines. And they might not call them ethical guidelines all the time, but guidelines for practice, for example, and this goes back long in history. Doctors have the Hippocratic Oath, which says, you know, the ethical thing is to look after their patients. I must actually look up what the Hi Hippocratic Oath is. You know, they, they take this commitment. I, feel, I don't know the actual wording. I should check it up. We all should check it out, right? But other professional organizations, especially nowadays, all have guidelines. I don't know, the Association of Accountants, they have guidelines to do with finances and so on. The dentists, the social workers, social workers have guidelines, right? Psychology, judges, Lawyers, well, I don't know whether lawyers actually obey any guidelines. Do lawyers have any guide at all? They're just attack dogs, really, aren't they? Yeah, anyway, by the way, the idea is that many professional organizations are professional because their members follow a code, a set of rules, a set of norms. And these rules are well known and published, published and and you agree to, to abide by them when you join the professional association, like the ASA or the AAA. It's a representative body, but also a membership body, and it sort of claims to be, claims to be, the peak organized form of professional 
and topology in these cases. So this discussion could uh, impact on all kinds of knowledge in the university. The sociology uh, association has, of different countries, have similar guidelines, political science association, the geographers, etc., etc. And in fact, universities have such guidelines on how to do supervision with PhD students, or even guidelines on how students should behave. In fact, some of them, like the PhD guideline one, I helped write um, back long ago, and there weren't any, and that's now being copied and copied and copied. Plagiarism. <laughs> but these guidelines are, yes, a code, and that means to be decoded. When you read them, I think as responsible people, we can't just read them as if they were just rules to be followed. They're to be interpreted guidelines. It doesn't mean strict rules. But there are some things that maybe we should take as rules. So what should anthropolog anthropological and other researchers know about guidelines? Well, one that Knowledge is never um, innocent, a neutral thing. It always comes with bias, the bias we've been talking about, the anthropologists have, or loaded interests, or vested interests. What's the word for this? Interests in general. And um, that be true whether you are involved in what's being studied or just an observer. Your interest in it, to whatever degree, shapes what can be known in some way. What you can retain, what you can learn, what you can understand, what you can challenge, has all got to do with your own set of biases, and understandings that you bring to any body of knowledge. Now, quite often, because of the professional association, because of history, that body of knowledge seems like it's a set and established already block of knowledge that you need to get hold of and then think about interpreting it. But it's not the case. Even as it's coming to you, even as a beginner, you are interpreting you are making sense of some will stick, some won't. Some will be interesting, some won't. And that's got to do with your own perspective. It's developing, it's changing, I hope, for everyone. That, that, that's the point of doing any academic work, is to see if you can change the way you think. But it's developing and it's, it's moving along all the time. Even confronted with an overwhelming amount of already established knowledge, you still will be selecting according to your past experience, your interests and biases, whether or not you've had a good teacher, whether or not you're inspired to do something, whether or not there's something else more interesting, all sorts of things. And that's true whether you're studying tourism or um, mythology or shamans or, 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 or family kinship systems or labor or or museums or, or whatever. The order in which things are placed in a museum is not true, not objective, but is interested according to what the museum is trying to do or what the director of the museum, the curator, thought would be the best way. And they thought whichever was the best way because of their own experience from the beginning to developing their, 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 their professional persona, what they thought was of interest to them, what they were made to think was of interest to them. You must look at this book, it's really interesting, means you probably should have a look at the book, but you might think, no, that last time that he said, look at this book, it was really boring, so I'm not gonna look at that one. Your choices shape what knowledge you get, Man, how you feel on a particular day shapes 
how you your interests, right? It might be raining and grey and kind of grim on that day, and that might make you lethargic or bored. Or it might make you quite energized. Some people really like storms, for example, and that gets them alive. The things that they come across on that day might be of more interest. See, on the day in which you read such and such a text, that might really inspire you. If you'd have read it a week earlier or a week later, it just might not grab you as much. We are funny things, humans, our interests. But we are in Vietnam. And you know, this is a really the impact of knowledge on people was really brought home in important and significant ways by things that happened in this country that in most anthropology classes is not discussed, not much anymore. And I think it's a really great opportunity to talk about it in Vietnam. You know, it's really interesting to think about the way in which research in anthropology in Vietnam had impacts on people here and on anthropology in the world, everywhere, to the extent that no other place can really say the same thing. And I want to explain that this, this, this week. I do that by talking about the history of the guidelines of the United States AAA and the role of the US Army in Vietnam in the American War and the work of an anthropologist of Vietnam, a Vietnamese, well, his mother Vietnamese, father French, I think, called George Condominus, who wrote this book. This book, We Have Eaten the Forest, by the Rade, in, um, he was in Suluk, Saluk, Saluk, Okay, a Montagnard um, people, Nunga, in the highlands, and he wrote this ethnography. It's an amazing read. I really recommend if you're going to choose an anthropologist, you choose this one uh, for, for the great read that it is. But also, it's a little bit terrifying because if you do field work with these people at this time, it was long ago, you have to drink a lot, a lot of alcohol. They seem to drink every day, and it's almost always a drinking competition. So he has drunk a lot to get this book done. But the book tells the story of uh, marriages and deaths and rituals and uh, forest gardens and shifting and, and all sorts of really interesting things. And, Plenty of photographs of them and um, lots of practicalities about growing gardens and um, what happens with death and what's the right way to show respect to the households or the elders or the, the family, what happens when some Lovers get together who maybe should not, and how things like so-called unwanted pregnancies are resolved and included back in. All sorts of really nitty-gritty. It's a great read. It's, it's written like a diary. And on the back, it's, it's, it's got a quotation uh, about how good the book is from Claude Levi-Strauss. So like for 1957, when the book was made, that's high praise because right, he was the number one anthropologist at the time. Um, and I want to make a kind of case study of this because the story of a Montagnard village in the central highlands of Vietnam is an example of classic good ethnography. Right, there's nothing... Well, I mean... No doubt, there always is some criticism you can make of an ethnography. Maybe he drinks too much. But there's nothing unethical about what he does. 
I mean, yeah, you can probably, if you went there and asked around enough, you could probably identify which village and you could find out who some of the people are. But I don't think anyone would be embarrassed about the study. It's good quality, field work. He really knows his stuff, partly because he's Vietnamese, right? Um, he's not of this village, but he's, he, he could get access, you know, in a way that a uh, white Westerner could not, a French or an American. So that's really interesting, and I'll give you the book to have a look at, pass it around, and you've had a look. But 1957 is when the book was published. In 1961, the book was translated into English by the CIA. Not by him, not by anyone he know. He didn't even know. But the special operations forces, special ops, the marines, basically, the undercover special operations mountain patrols of the CIA translated this book to use as a guide for fighting the war and recruiting these Montenard, these villages, recruiting them to fight on the side of the Americans to fight against communism. And George Condominus did not know about this. Right? So his knowledge was used by the military so that they could find the right way to approach those people with respect, showing doing the right, you know, they knew, well, we're going to have to drink with them, we're going to have to bring some presents, we're going to have to do this and that and the other. Because they read this book, they could come across as knowledgeable and friendly and approach these people and get them on side to not go to the side of the Viet Minh. So it's really interesting. He didn't know in 1961. But in 1968, because the American Anthropological Association were interested and concerned about anthropology in Vietnam, for reasons I'll explain, they invite him to give a talk to the annual conference of the AAA. And he at that conference said, I've just found out recently that my book was translated by the CIA. So you've got to imagine this, that the American soldiers going through the jungle, like Rambo, whatever, are carrying this book in their backpack as like a guidebook. Now, people were very, he was very upset because, of course, he didn't support, not of course, but he didn't support the Americans. And they were using his very intimate and detailed ethnography for very brutal and unfortunate consequence. Now, how did the AAA get interested in Vietnam? So they were in the midst of the civil rights movement in America, and uh, of course that fed over to the um, student protests against involvement in Vietnam. Martin Luther King gave speeches on both issues, black rights and Vietnam, in 68 in the Riverside Church, and especially at universities like Michigan uh, and other places, there were many protests. And there was a thing called a teaching. A teaching became famous after the fact, and it's not really clear that they are all that good, but a teaching was when the students decided, because they wanted to protest one issue, civil rights, or it started with civil rights, but then later it was black rights, then uh, feminism, and then um, Vietnam. They cancelled all classes and went to the square of the university and protested. But instead of just standing around listening to speeches or um, doing whatever, which is, can be boring, they also sometimes organised teach-ins, which meant that the teachers who supported them, left-wing teachers usually, would give their classes outside, 
to anyone who wanted to come. And usually their classes were not like the usual classes, but were much more what they really believed, much more radical. And the guy who's supposed to, who's, who's credited with starting this, I don't think he really started it because, but he's famous enough that people said, yeah, it was around, is Marshall Silence. Marshall Silence doing the first teachings at Michigan. And um, these were Vietnam moratorium, like stop the war teachings. They were about what was happening in international relations and it was students of America in solidarity with Vietnam wanting to stop the war. Marshall Silence was then invited to Vietnam, paid to travel north and south. And um, he came in 1965. You know, for someone to come who was not part of the military effort in those days, that was a big thing. Think of Jane Fonda. When Jane Fonda visited, well, the media went crazy, right? Well, Martian Silence was not as famous. He was a young professor. And this was uh, still a big thing, though. Comes and he visits, and you can read actually his article where he describes his visit in this book. Today I'm handing out books for you all to look at, trying to get you to choose an anthropologist, I suppose. Marshall Silence book, chapter in this book. This is Anthropologist and the Public Sphere, speaking out in on war, peace, and American power. This is his uh, newspaper article, magazine article in The Nation. Once you've broken him down about going to Vietnam and meeting some American soldiers who are working behind the scenes. Soldiers that had taken this book with them and they were using what they considered to be necessary interrogation techniques like torture to force, encourage, to request, to get the Rade and others to either work with the Americans to help fight, etc., or to inform on the Viet Minh. And this is a long interview, well, not that long, but an interview with Mr. X, Mr. X, who's um, the one who says, once you've broken him down. They use psychological torture techniques. They'd actually read these, read up on these from um, Chinese techniques and from the Inquisition and from history. I mean, these were not unintelligent army grunts, like it's made out that they're like, you know, Rambo or something like that. They're not just violent. They were intellectuals of a sort. Okay, why were they intellectuals of a sort? Because the CIA and the Rand Corporation were active in Vietnam using, using anthropology as a cover for their activity. Using anthropology as a, like a, as a front for spying. Rand Corporation. What have you heard of Rand Corporation before? Do you know what they are also responsible for in large part? You use it every day. We're using it right now. The internet. They invented the uh, multiple node system that made the relay system through multiple nodes. So there is no one center for the internet. Right? That was a military application. 
right? Because the idea is you can knock out that part of the network, but that won't destroy the network because the network can go around because it's a network without a center. Rand Corporation invents the internet. But before they did that, they were involved in Vietnam. I mean, they cleaned up their act, but they were hiring and told, you can still buy novels by Vietnamese young women whose parents worked for Rand Corporation in the South. They live in America now. Yet Q, yeah. Uh, or you can read the history of the company. They proudly tell the history and they even tell some of the dubious things they did because they confess sort of thing, that that was our past but now we do this. But Rand Corporation and the CIA hired many anthropologists like Donald Hickey. Donald Hickey who also worked in the Highlands and he worked for seven or eight years for the CIA in Vietnam. So by 1965, Silence and Eric Wolf and a woman called Kathleen Goff, who wrote this wonderful book, Ten Times More Beautiful. She was one of the main protesters within the AAA. She worked mostly in India. And she was there in America at the time protesting against the AAA because the AAA and RAND advertised in the anthropology newsletter for an anthropologist to come and work in Vietnam. I mean, it wasn't the first time they'd hired an anthropologist. They'd had hired many before. But this was the first time they advertised openly in the anthropological newsletter. It's like they were brazen enough to do it. Now, because of this, she was invited to um, Hanoi in 1975, after the end of the war, 76 actually, uh, to do a visit. And she visits and writes a book on the rebuilding, 10 times more beautiful. We will build the country 10 times more beautiful, right? Famous quote. And it's very interesting because she then tells the history. She doesn't tell the history of the AAA. She tells the history of what's been happening in Vietnam. and keeps on comparing to India. Ask them all around. But um, her role in the AAA was to push through the adoption of a permanent ethics committee within the American Anthropological Association to always have an ethics committee and its first head was the left-wing historian anthropologist, Eric Wolf. Now they talked about this in terms of methodology a lot. Okay, so what is it that anthropologists do? They combine anecdotes with textual evidence and evaluation of reports and articles. And we can see in, for example, a condominus book, he does that, lots of anecdotes, or in Levi Strauss's work, or in, in Kathleen Goff's work, that's what a good anthropologist does. Right? They compile, they evaluate historical d debates and collections, yeah, and write papers of different issues. But sometimes there are controversies that come up where the anthropologists have maybe taken some shortcuts. Now, the Vietnam War isn't the first war where anthropologists were involved. You know that because we've already read some of that. We read about Evans Pritchard in Africa with the, the soldiers, right? Fighting the Italians in Africa. And we know about Malinowski in World War I and so on. We can also talk about how uh, Ruth Benedict, even though her teacher, Franz Boas, said anthropologists should never be involved in the war, Ruth Benedict wrote a compilation of historical debates and textual evaluation, reports and articles on Japan called Patterns of Culture, Patterns of Japanese Culture, 
the chrysanthemum and the sword, about militarism in the Japanese psyche. She never actually went to Japan, but she wrote this for use of the Americans in the war and after the war in the colonial occupation of Japan. It's been translated into Tingyet. Uh, that's an interesting thing. Pass it around as well. Of all the anthropology texts to, um, to translate, this one, I wonder why. But still, she had never been to Japan, but she wrote this study to assist the military. And people were quite concerned about this. You've gone against your teacher, uh, so on. But, all right, the British Association made its first statement in 1948 on ethics. But it was really in 68, with the adoption of the Ethics Committee with Eric Wolf, that the American Association got involved. Right? They critiqued anthropological involvement. But actually before that, another big aspect of the connection between the ethics debate, the AAA and Vietnam, is the Tribal Research Center in Thailand. I've been there in Chiang Mai. There's a place called the Tribal Research Center where anthropological study is mostly done by anthropologists from Sydney University. So I've been to some seminars in Sydney University where they talked about this. When they were giving advice, there was something like, the version in, in a seminar I heard was, you're trying to bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail, right? Where do you bomb? It's all jungle, as far as you can see from the sky, mountainous jungle. And they said, well, bomb halfway up the mountain because the Hmong or the, the, the Raglai or the whoever, whichever tribal group in this area, they don't build their villages on the top of the mountain, but they ethnographic knowledge to decide who to bomb from way up on high. And you know they dropped more bombs on the Ho Chi Minh Trail than any other part of the planet so far, right? They really wanted to. So this was very controversial. I mean, it's not the only controversial thing from the Tribal Research Center. There are other issues, and it's still debated in the anthropology department in Sydney to this day, I suppose, but last time I was there, there's still a split in the department. Those who think it wasn't so bad, those who think it was completely outrageous. There are other things, Project Camelot we can mention, but the one that I really have a soft spot for because it's so controversial is this one. Oh, didn't work. 1,162 pages on the minority groups of the Republic of Vietnam. Minority groups of the Republic of Vietnam. This book, this book I bought in a secondhand bookshop in District 3, right? No, it's just a normal book, but it's from 1965. It's very old. I bought it in a secondhand bookshop. But this book, I thought, wow, that looks really interesting. Ethnographic study series. Must be good, no? Okay. Open it up. Minority groups in the Republic of Vietnam for contributors. Contributors, why? Bought in Saigon on the 7th of March, 1969, by somebody, Chow? 
What do you think? That's E U Nurch Nachu Nale Vietnamese name though, right? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, it was a second hand bookstore. Can you make the name out? Too hard, isn't it? Okay. It looks like Chow. Tao? Man. Anyway, somebody bought this in 1969 and eventually it's gone into the second hand bookshop. And I've got hold of it thinking, I'm an anthropologist, I'm teaching anthropology, this will be really useful. Well, it is useful, but not in the way I expected. This volume, I'm reading the front page now for you. This volume was prepared by the Cultural Information Analysis Center, CINFAC. Never heard of them. Center for Research and Systems, CRESS, never heard of them, of the American University. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. The preface. CRESS, operating under contract with the Office of the Chief of Research and Development Department of the Army, has developed through SINFAC this ethnographic study of selected tribal and other minority groups of the Republic of Vietnam. A book done by the Army. Why does the Army do a book on ethnography? First question. They are fighting, right? Okay, and what's in the book? I quickly flip through before I read it and I see like, uh, where's an example? There's all sorts of little drawing pictures of crops and, and pipes, a pipe they smoke opium from and cooking, sickle, some spears or fork or something, barbecue implements. And, um, you know, I'm just flipping through and think, yeah, okay, it's, it's 600 uh, uh, thousand dong, sao cham nin dong, but I think I can spend that because this one I really think I want, okay. But the content, when I finally read it, really shocked me. All right, here's an example of a picture. Pictures of the huts. All right, what we're going to do to give you an idea of the content is you just choose any page. Open it at any place. Okay, this one. Civic action considerations. All right, we've got to find, this is section 10, so we'll find out which tribal group they're studying. The principal, communication techniques, subversive influences. All right, it's the Stieng village. The Stieng group. Stieng. I don't know who they are. Stieng. They live in the central highlands. Phuc Long. Phuc Long. Okay. So now I'm going to read to you about them. Their huts, their tribal background, their individual characters, social structure, customs and taboos about their dress. Sting, sting, sting. Women ordinarily wear a short skirt and leave the upper part of the body nude. On ceremonial occasions, the women usually wear a cloth 9 to 12 feet long draped over one shoulder and tied under the opposite armpit. The long cloth is used to carry their babies. Jewelry or other ornaments. They have numerous fears and superstitions. Rice is the basic staple of their diet. Outsiders are forbidden entrance into a sting village under certain circumstances. 
Religion, principal spirits, sun, moon, earth, sky, lightning. Economic organization, they have a subsistence economy. Please. Political organizations. The village is the highest degree of political organization. Method of selecting year leaders, authority within the village, legal system. <clears throat> Tribal laws and tribunals. Subversive influences. Factors contributing to vulnerability of the sting to subversion, a geographical location, historical isolation, and their traditional suspicion of the Vietnamese. Due to Viet Cong activity, effective governmental presence and control had been on the wane since the Sting area in the early 1960s. The principal objective of subversive activity among the Sting is to divert tribal which are essential for communication and supply between Viet Cong bases in the tribal area and across the border in Cambodia and their military operations in the Mekong Delta. This is not your usual anthropology. Talking about how a tribal group is involved in politics like this. Mm. And that's just a page you selected. I can go to any page. Let's take another one. Okay, I just picked another one. Paramilitary capabilities. Given the incentive and motivation provided with the necessary training, leadership and support, the Je can become an effective force against the Viet Cong. The tribesmen can serve as informers, trackers and guides, intelligent agents, interpreters and translators. With intensive training and support, the Je can be organized to defend their villages against the Viet Cong. With good leadership, they can be organized into an effective counter guerrilla combat unit. The Je have a reputation for engaging in aggressive warfare if they are provoked or if they have a justifiable reason. In the past, they were considered capable fighters. This is a guide to how to use anthropology, anthropological knowledge collected by these authors to recruit people to the American side on the war. And they recruited many Montanat. Say? Shh, please. Listen. Hey, listen. Show some respect. Yeah. But here is anthropology being used as a part of the war effort. And this is what provoked 1968, the American Anthropological Association, to develop the guidelines, the ethics committee that developed. So previously, anthropologists have been involved in warfare, as I said, Ruth Benedict, Patterns of Culture. And previously, guidelines for anthropologists have been just a little few anecdotes. Evans Pritchard said, nobody really told me how to be an anthropologist. This is important for your final, right? Because I'm asking you to think about your final in terms of what would you do if you did field work. Right? That's your assignment. So Evans Pritchard used to say, nobody really told me what, how to do it. They just said, take lots of quinine and don't touch the women. Malinowski, you know, he's basically even more to the right. He said, well, we should do field work to stop black Bolshevism. We don't want those Africans going over to Lenin. But previously, there had not been much in way of talking about methodology, how you do field work. A little from what we got from the introduction of books. But now, in 68, there was going to be guidelines. And this was the political use of knowledge that had been exposed by these kind of books, by the fact of anthropologists working for um, 
the military. But it applied also to other sectors, like for if you work for a company, a mining company or something, of course also the knowledge is important. I give the example of uh, a hydroelectric dam being built in Sarawak, where the anthropologist there, Jerome Rosso, agreed, he signed a letter to agree that his, not, his book, his research, would never be made public. So it would stay the permission of the company. Like that's kind of shocking because the whole idea of anthropology is to make knowledge in a university which is open to everyone. Okay, so what kind of research are you doing and where's the borderline? I mean, if you're doing market research, do you have the same ethics as a researcher for ethnography or anthropology? Not really, because market research is basically advertising. And in a way, that's, you're committed to the profits of the company. Right? But the idea of knowledge in general is what's at stake. And, and earlier I said, you know, knowledge is always attached to interests. Your interests determine what you find out and know, what sticks. So, you know, it's not really market research or, or research to help the authorities or the people. It's in all cases there is some ambiguity about why you are doing your research. Or at least the question of why and what its impact will be is a bit more open. For example, Condominus writes that book, We Eat the Forest, with no idea that the CIA will use it to recruit those people to the American side on the war. He had no conception that he was writing effectively what would be a very good guidebook for them to use. So that's why this ethics question came up and it was formulated in the first teachings and uh, anthropological association meetings. Now, right now, for the second time since 2011, the UK Association are revisiting its guidelines. In, 19, in 2011, they, they was the last time they um, had a series of meetings to rewrite the guidelines and now they're doing it again uh, this year, the last year and a half. But in 2011 they said they seek to encourage anthropologists to think about the ethical implications of their work in a profound and continuous way. An ethical approach must centrally avoid causing harm to our subjects by what we do in the field or write about them and, idea, and idea, ideally ensures a reciprocal exchange of benefits. This requires much more than ticking off a checklist of do's and don'ts. This is the thing, you can't write a list of do this, don't do that because in each situation, if it's market research or if it's work for a mining company or, or work in tourism or work, the do's and don'ts are going to be different. How can you teach this? You only can alert people to the need to be reflexive. You can't give a list of do's and don'ts, although in my list it would be don't work for the military, right? For the US imperialist military. Yeah, you can work for the people's army, no problem. But even then, it's ambiguous, right? World War II, the good war against fascism, that's very different to the current war in Syria. Right? You might want to fight against the Nazis, but not against Assad. You might want to fight against Assad. But they say, don't cause harm. Now, consideration must be, what if knowledge causes harm? But Condominus, his book did cause harm. It allowed the Americans to recruit the Montagnards to the war effort and that meant that they were drawn into the war and some will have got killed. He had no idea. He could not anticipate that his book would do that. So how can you know the work you're doing on what? I don't know. I work on diasporic South Asians in Britain. That should be neutral, right? Just talking about them. 
But then, from the mid-90s onwards, immigration law became a really huge issue, as you know, because of what happened to a Vietnamese, 39 Vietnamese in a lorry truck two years ago, just gone to court this week, right? What was a neutral subject, migration and diaspora and the enthusiasm that Britain had in the 90s for diasporic, for, for ethnicity, for multiculturalism, has now turned into a political issue with deadly consequences. The British state ramped up the security guard, the security system from mid-90s onwards, and the one hand saying, yes, yes, we want you to come for cheap labour, and the other hand, on the other hand, putting up incredibly strong police barriers so that people had to try and get through illegally in refrigerated trucks and hidden in different ways, right? And 39 died. Now, they tried to blame it on the traffickers. They said, oh, it's these evil traffickers that did it. But no, it's not. It's the government that introduced more strict, uh, heavier police restrictions on migrants coming into the country because they had read the kind of work that people had been doing on migration. It became more political. So even a topic that seems fairly innocent, tourism. People study tourism in our department a lot. But you know, it's completely changed now after COVID. Uh, the investment in tourism studies now, before it was, yeah, we are doing tourism studies and 7 million international guests come every year. It's all good. Let's, let's boost it. Talk about how great it is. Go to the Raglai or wherever, Anyang, and, and, and talk about eco-tourism and building lodges and so on. Well, now huge amounts of money are being lost in this sector, jobs and so on, and the research context has changed. They couldn't have anticipated that. So knowledge and how it causes harm, all right, the harm caused to the tourism sector is not as much as the harm caused to people dying because of immigration, but fortunes are still being lost. How it causes harm can change. Information sometimes can put lives in jeopardy. We have to ask that. Sometimes it only puts money in jeopardy. I have less concern. But what is the appropriate use of knowledge? How should we use knowledge? How should we use methods of analysis, collection, distribution? I mean, this study by Ruth Benedict, she collected previous anthropology subjects. This study on the minorities is a collection of information from previous studies. It's not based on ethnography. And so I think in that respect, it's doubly corrupt. Like it's, you know, I'm against plagiarism, right? Because they don't acknowledge, it doesn't acknowledge the work that's done by someone. Well, these cases is doubly and triply guilty of that. Not only have they not acknowledged where the information is from, they're using the information to help the military. So the ASA talk about the issues in the checklist. Consent, informed consent, not exploiting, care for animals. And in the second half after the break, I'm going to talk about animals and photographs. Transparency and anonymity, and anonymity, the consequences of funding. Who funds your knowledge? And do they have a say in what you look at? And government control, freedom of inquiry. All these questions are difficult and unresolved in the question of guidelines. Okay, so we have a bit of a break. Lots of time. 13.36, so until 13.46, and uh, we'll see if this recording is still working. Thank you. Still is. Okay, I'm going to break for 10 minutes. <laughs>